All right, now let's talk about Chapter 7, the cell. Of course, as we saw um, in the first chapter, um, all living things are made of cells. So in a biology class, you definitely want to cover cells, which I'm sure you have to a certain extent in the past. Perhaps we'll do it in a little more detail here. First, though, we have to do a history lesson because there was a time in human history, in fact, for most of human history, when people were unaware of such things as cells in this whole microscopic world. It wasn't until the 1600s when some people started to use microscopes to look at this microscopic world and living things. Robert Hooke was the first to look at something that at least was alive at one time. He was looking at cork cells. Cork comes from the bark of a particular type of tree, and it basically consists of dead cells. And he coined the term cell because it reminded him of the cells in a monastery, long rows of rooms, or basically long rows of cells. Um, he was an Englishman. Anton von Leeuwenhoek, he was a Dutchman, and he was credited with the, to be the first person to look at live cells. And he looked at pond water and spit and blood and all sorts of things. And in particular, in the pond water, as I think is exhibited by this one, he would see things swimming around, these little tiny microorganisms that could swim around. Um, so, looked at living cells. Now, these guys, Schleid and Schwann, they sort of expanded the knowledge on what kind of organisms contain cells. In particular, Schleiden confirmed, whoops, not animals, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. He confirmed, he confirmed that not just cork from this particular kind of tree, but basically all plants have cells. And Schwann, that basically animals are made of cells. Um, so evidence was building that basically all living things are made of cells. And that became the first point, the first tenet, if you will, of the cell theory. All living things are made of cells. If you don't have a cell, you don't have a living thing. Two, cells are the basic units of structure and function living things. That is, they make up not only just the structure of the organism, but the cells are what do everything. They do all the things that are part of our metabolism. They carry out all those reactions. Cells only come from existing cells. They don't spring forth out of thin air. They have to come from existing cells. We'll see in later chapters some folks who were involved with this third point, in particular a guy named Louis Pasteur, a Frenchman. All right, so the microscope, we want to know a bit about that, these different parts, main parts of the microscope, and the fact that this is a compound microscope, that is it has two lenses, and those lenses, which consist of the ocular lens, which is up in the eyepiece, and the objective lenses, together they determine the magnification of the object. Typically an ocular lens is a ten times magnification. Uh, on the scopes we use, the objective lenses are 4x, 10x, 40, and 100. You multiply those together to get your total magnification, which I put 400 and 1,000. <clears throat> so, of course, microscopes are very useful for looking at things, be they plant cells or animal cells, or microscopic bacteria and other types of microbes. They give us a good look at the detail inside of the cells, these chloroplasts here inside of these plant cells, for example. Now, the light microscope has limitations. In fact, about a thousand times magnification is the most that you can really clearly see with a light microscope. but we can use electron microscopes to see much smaller things and in greater detail 
Um, they're rather expensive, large pieces of equipment, so you tend to find them just at universities and private companies, um, not, not high schools. Um, there's two types, two main types of electron microscopes. It's called a transmission electron microscope and a scanning electron microscope. And the main difference is that the scanning kind of gives you a look at the outside surface of an object, whereas the transmission sort of gives you a look at a slice of the object, looking inside it. So it gives you internal detail, whereas the scanning gives you external detail. And I believe this thing we're looking at, if I'm not mistaken, is a pollen grain. And this is something that will come up in the next section. It's a cross-section of a flagellum. All right, so the idea of these microscopes is to magnify things and see small things. The light microscope has a particular range. It can see down to bacterium and, of course, larger things. Scanning electron or electron microscopes are good for, of course, seeing cells and things, but they can allow us to see viruses and even, even individual molecules. Um, notice the scale here, of course, a centimeter, we know what that is, millimeter, there are 10 millimeters in a centimeter, but here we have the micron or micrometer, and essentially there are 1,000 micrometers in one millimeter. So in one millimeter, you have 1,000 microns, so when we get down to the size of bacteria and even cells, you can see your typical cells range from anywhere from, in the case of bacteria, 1 micron up to 100 microns. So even that large, really large cell is only a tenth of a millimeter in size, so really quite small. All right, cells can be divided between two main types of organisms. Prokaryotes, these are sometimes described as, well, basically they comprise what we primarily think of as the bacteria. They are organisms that are all single-celled. They have, structurally speaking, relatively simple cells compared to the eukaryotes down here. Um, here's a cartoonish image of a typical bacterium. Don't worry about the details too much. Um, we'll get to those a little later. And eukaryotes are cells that are more structurally complex, and they're found not in bacteria, but the other four groups of organisms, basically these things called protista, fungi, plants, and animals. These are all eukaryotes, whereas essentially the bacteria are the prokaryotes. Much greater complexity, as we'll see um, in the next section, in uh, eukaryotic cells. Now, let's talk about that a bit more. So with cell structure, we're going to focus on eukaryotic cells, although we'll talk a little bit about prokaryotes as well. And of course, there's all these different things that we're going to go through here inside of your typical cell. And here we're looking at a just a hypothetical animal cell. First of all, the cytoplasm. So, of course, you've got an outer membrane, you've got a nucleus, and everything between the outer membrane and the nucleus is the cytoplasm. And so the cytoplasm first consists of the liquid part, liquid part, and then all the organelles, basically these different structures inside the cytoplasm that are sort of bathed in the liquid, and each of those structures has particular jobs to do. <clears throat> okay, so now at the very center of the cell, you have the nucleus. The nucleus is sometimes thought of as sort of the command center of the cell. Um, it's where we have the DNA, um, and we'll see later chromatin is basically a somewhat synonymous term for DNA when it's in a particular condition. So that essentially contains the instructions for how the cell is supposed to do what it's supposed to do. The, the nucleus has a, a, a membrane called the nuclear envelope. Um, it has a nucleolus, this dark region inside, and we'll see that the nucleolus is where RNA is made, this other nucleic acid. 
and there are openings or nuclear pores. Um, and the nucleus is connected to this organelle we know as the endoplasmic reticulum, which we'll get to in just a little while. So organelles have lots of different jobs. Some are storage, particular vacuoles often are used for storage. Here's the large central vacuole of a plant where most of the water is stored. Some organisms, like certain types of these, this is an example of a protestum, otherwise known as a paramecium, and it has a contractile vacuole whose job is to absorb excess water and then basically expel it from the cell. Um, vesicles, vesicles are smaller, oh, and chlor uh, vacuoles are surrounded by a membrane. Vesicles are smaller membrane bound structures whose job is primarily to move things around. Um, but there's a particular kind of vesicle known as a lysosome, and it has a membrane, but it has particular proteins in it that act as enzymes, and in particular, they're often involved with digestion or basically breaking down things. So lysosomes are used to break things down inside the cell. All right, the cytoskeleton. It's a series of microtubes and microfilaments who basically are the analogous to the skeleton that we have. It's the skeleton of the cell, you might say. It provides the internal structure of the cell. It holds things in place. Um, so the organelles, the other organelles, don't just float around the cell, but they're held in place by the cytoskeleton. They're also used, particularly the microtubules, for transport of things around the cell. Think of the microtubule as kind of a road that things move along. Microtubules in flagella, and also these things called cilia, which are kind of like small versions of flagella, help to cause that those cilia and flagella to move back and forth and can cause and can move the cell around. Um, so they're involved with both transport inside the cell and moving the cell itself. Now, of course, not all cells move. In fact, not many of them do, but there are some where movement of the cell is very important, and these are the structures that do that. Centrioles. Centrioles are microtubules that animal cells in particular have, and the centrioles are close to the nucleus, and we'll see later that they are very important in making microtubules that are used in cell division. When we study mitosis and meiosis later, we'll get back to those. Um, some organelles are involved with building protein, the ribosomes, which are the site of where proteins are made. The endoplasmic reticulum, which we saw earlier is connected to the nucleus, often has ribosomes attached to it. Um, and after the proteins are made, um, the they're packaged into little transport vesicles that sort of break off the endoplasmic reticulum. And their job is to travel to the Golgi apparatus, which is a series of flattened membrane sacs whose job is to receive those transport vesicles, um, further process those proteins, and then send them out in other vesicles that take those proteins to where they're needed, sometimes inside, sometimes to be released from the cell. Um, the nuclear envelope, endoplasmic reticulum, and Golgi apparatus and all those vesicles uh, that are breaking off of them and form on them are known as the endomembrane system, the internal membrane system. Chloroplast found in plants and other photosynthesizing organisms whose job is to process sunlight energy and essentially to make food for the plant. Mitochondria, these are organelles that basically take food, break them down, and release energy that we can use to do the things we need. Of course, cells have boundaries. They, we mentioned they have a cell, well, they have sometimes a cell wall plants, bacteria in particular, also fungi have cell walls. All cells have a cell membrane, 
which I'm running out of time here, but we'll talk about those in more detail, in particular these things, phospholipids, very important.